shall we start? Yeah. Shall we start, sir? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, Good afternoon to everyone. I welcome all of you to the 21st lecture in the lecture series in nonlinear dynamics conducted by the Department of Nonlinear Dynamics, Bharat Jawaharlal University. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Satya Mazumdar, Research Director, Laboratory of Theoretical Physics and Statistical Models, University of Paris, France. I came across Professor Satya Mazumdar's talk first time in the Bangalore School on Statistical Physics 5 which was held at the Raman Research Institute, Bengaluru, in 2014. He delivered a series of lectures, uh, to be precise, uh, six lectures, each one and a half hours duration, on the topic, Introduction to Random Matrix Theory, in that school. I still remember that we were in the second week and first day of that school, and it was Monday morning. He started his lecture at 9.30 a.m. and completed the first lecture at 11 a.m. 11 a.m one and a half hours lecture. Not to exaggerate, everyone in the hall felt the talk went only for five minutes and not one and a half hours. It was one of the wonderful lectures which I attended in my lifetime. Later, I understood that Majumdar is, a, is well known for the clarity of his talks and pedagogical lectures. After that school, I was thinking to invite him to our university. It has been materialized only now. When I started planning for this lecture series, I decided to invite him to deliver a lecture in this forum. In fact, I have requested him to deliver the same talk today, which I attended seven years ago, which is still running in my mind. Unfortunately, the talk was not being digitalized, and so we opted another title, which he is going to deliver today. Professor Satya Majumdar is one of the well-known statistical physicists of our country. His H index is 68 one of the highly cited physicists. To motivate the students, I wish to read out his biodata in a very brief manner. He was a gold medalist both in BSc and MSc and completed his PhD at TAFR, Mumbai. Immediately after that, he carried out his postdoctoral studies in the United States about four years and came back to India. After working at TAFR about three to four years, he went back and settled in France. He won several international awards given by even for physics community. To name a few, I can cite, he, was, he has been awarded Prime D Excellence Scientific U Award given by CNRS, CNRS Silver Medal, European Physical Society Prize for Statistical and Nonlinear Physics, Gay Lusak Humboldt Prize. I have only mentioned a few. He is in editorial board for several international journals and been served as honorary position in several institutions around the globe. Students, please visit his homepage and have a look at his CV. His CV is 160 pages. Since I don't want to take much of his time, now I hand over the session to Professor Satya Majumdar. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. So, so thank you, Professor uh, Senthil, for, for a wonderful, uh, for a very nice introduction. And I'm really uh, quite moved. And, uh, and I'm very pleased to be here. And unfortunately, I cannot i am not being able to go there in person, but uh, hopefully in uh, near future, I'll do that. So thank you again for the invitation. And it's really a great pleasure for me to talk to you today. So I'm going to talk about uh, extreme value statistics. Uh, so this is a subject on which uh, you know we have been working for many years now. And uh, so what I'll do today uh, is to give you a sort of uh, overview and perspective, uh, more in the colloquium style talk rather than details. Uh, I mean, I just wanted to tell you why this subject is interesting, what are the main questions, and what are the kind of uh, methods we use to, to attack this problem, how statistical physics can be useful for this, uh, and so on, and uh, and also maybe discuss some of the you know open problems at the end. So, so this will be a more broad perspective rather than uh, details of uh, computation. So hopefully, uh, you, will, uh, you, will, you will at least get some feeling about the subject. Okay, so, so you know, extreme events uh, like uh, earthquake or tsunami or uh, typhoon, these are sort of rare events. They do not happen every day, fortunately, or even the pandemic that we're going through right now, for example. And so these rare events are rare. And um, 
So, but when they happen and if they happen, of course they can, you know, they, their effects can be devastating and for economy and for life and for everything. And so, so it's very important to understand the sort of magnitude of such extreme events or the frequency of such extreme events, when are they expected to occur? And, uh, and you know, many other related questions which are really of practical importance. And in fact, no wonder that this subject has been studied for a very long time, but mostly in the statistics literature and with many, many applications like climate studies and also in finance and economics, hydrology, sports, and many other subjects. And more recently, relatively recently, it actually made appearance in physics and mathematics, uh, in random walks, uh, in the physics of disordered systems, random matrices, uh, number theory in mathematics, and so on. I'll touch upon some of these subjects as I go along. Now. And so it's a, you know, it's a subject which has a lot of applications uh, in across disciplines. Uh, and also it has, you know, mm, uh, it has very beautiful mathematical problems uh, uh, that appear as part of the applications. So let me start with uh, an engineering application, just to just to give you a flavor. <clears throat> so, so imagine that uh, you know. So this is the what you see is the you know data for the Nile River. Uh, so this is the water level of the Nile River in near Cairo. Sorry, Please share your skin. Share your skin. Sorry. Yes. We are not seeing. I can come back. Ah. Yeah. Can you see it now? No. Ah. What happened? Uh, I have to redo everything in the, from the as you did earlier. Okay, I have to restart. Okay, so uh, so first I should say I should what I what should I what, uh, I yes, you just no. click on page now mm -hmm. from the entire screen. Can, yeah, can you see it now? No, no, no. no I see. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, it's coming. Okay. Yeah, fine, fine, fine. Let me make it full skin. Okay. Yeah, it's also fine. Can you see it now? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, okay. So, <clears throat> all right. So, this is the sort of data of the water level on the Nile River in near Cairo during 600 years AD, I mean, 600 to 1200 years AD. And uh, so the point is that imagine that you are a civil engineer uh, and uh, you, you want to, you know, you are tasked to build a dam over a river. Okay. So the question you ask is uh, how high the uh, dam should be. I mean, uh, what is the height that you would like to uh, make this dam? So what you have at your disposal is the data of the river height for the last few hundred years, like in this example. Okay. Now, in this example, this is a black, black line that you see, solid line, solid curve. So this is the average height you know, over some window, average over some window of the river. But is this really relevant for you? No, I mean, because I mean, what you are interested really are these extreme rare events, because once in a while, in some years, you will see that there's a flood or whatever it is, that suddenly the river height becomes very large. So your bridge should be higher than the typical value of these extreme rare events. It's not the average that counts. What counts really are the extremes. And if you want to construct your bridge or dam, its height should be above than the typical uh, height of these extreme events, you know, because they are the ones which count really. Okay. And the same thing actually occurs also, I mean, when you look at the, for example, the, the weather data, I mean, the, what you see here is this, uh, <clears throat> I think it's the rainfall data. Uh, or temperature data, for example. I mean, and again, you see there is an average, but then there's this, you know, once in a while you see these rare events, which are, you know, suddenly occurs uh, due to flood, due to, you know, the very uh, cold days or hot days, etc. And uh, and it's very important to understand, again, the frequency of these rare events, uh, also the magnitude of these rare events. Uh, and uh, And these are also, they play a very important role for global warming. Because you know the in the global warming, I mean, what is really important are these extreme fluctuations, not the average trend and of the temperature. Extreme fluctuations that counts really for the uh, for the uh, uh, for the global to understand the statistics of global warming and so on. Okay, so let me now give you an example from physics. Okay, 
So, <clears throat> so all of us are familiar with uh, disordered system, meaning uh, disordered system means that, you know, this is a system where you have a Hamiltonian, but the Hamiltonian is typically random, okay? So now any Hamiltonian for any system, you can always write, it's a quantum operator, you can always write in the site basis. So if you're, for example, if your model, your magnetic system, your model is defined on a graph, then the sites of the graph, it can construct a basis, and these are the matrix elements of this operator in that basis, H, I, J. Okay. So if you tell me a Hamiltonian, that means you basically specify these matrix elements. Okay. So and typically for, for quantum system, I mean, this is a sort of n by n, if your system size is n, n sites in your system, this is a n by n Hermitian random matrix. And you need to be Hermitian so that the operators, you know, the, the eigenvalues are real. And so in a disordered system, typically these elements are all random elements. Okay. So they are just frozen random variables. So, for example, I mean, if you if 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 you have only nearest neighbor interaction, that means this i j, uh, they are just uh, neighbors in the on the lattice. Uh, then this matrix, of course, will be tri-diagonal because you know the 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 site and its two neighbors they are uh, they are non-zero, whereas there is no connection to the other neighbors, so it will be a tri-diagonal matrix. And this is the famous Anderson model that all, many of you may have heard about. Uh, and on the other hand. If uh, if it involves all sites, okay, if all sites are connected to each other, then the matrix is full, and this is what is called the mean field model. Okay, now in the mean field model where this matrix is totally full, I mean, so what you have is a sort of n by n matrix, uh, Hermitian random matrix, and if you choose the entries to be completely independent Gaussian variables, uh, in the in a way choose the variance such that you can write the joint distribution of the entries of the random matrix as the product of the individual Gaussian elements. And because they are, you know, because you have chosen the variance to be like this, so you can write this as exponential minus sum hij mod square, which of course is nothing but the trace of h dagger h, right? h dagger is the Hermitian conjugate of h. So why I'm writing this way? Because you choose these Gaussian entries in such a way that the joint distribution of the matrix entries has this form. And the reason for this is that once you write as trace of H dagger H, you see that if you make a change of basis, that means from this side basis, if you make a rotation, if you go to another basis, that means you just change this H by a unitary matrix, uh, you know, multiplied by an unitary matrix. And under unitary matrix multiplication, you see that the trace is invariant, right? If you go H to U dagger H U, then this trace is invariant, which means that you know the, your your you know system description is invariant under the change of basis, and that is why it's you know this is called the Gaussian unitary ensemble of random matrix because it's invariant under a unitary rotation. Okay, so once you have chosen the matrix elements, then for every realization of your disorder, that means of your of your Hamiltonian, you need to I you know diagonalize the the matrix to get uh, n real eigenvalues. Uh, so these are your energy levels, if you like, in your system. It's very general. I mean, so these are the energy levels, the spectrum of your of your Hamiltonian. And of course, what we are, and then of course, I mean, what happens is that they, they are usually, even though the matrix elements, matrix entries are independent Gaussian variables, the eigenvalues are of course all get strongly correlated. Okay. And uh, and what we are typically interested in disordered system is for example the ground state energy that means out of all the spectrum you want to find out the the energy eigenvalue which is which has the which is the minimum of all this set and of course this minimum is going to vary from one relation of the dis disorder to another relation so it's a random variable which fluctuates from one one uh, disorder relation to another disorder relation so what we are interested in typically in disordered system is how this ground state energy fluctuates from sample to sample and you see again that this is uh, an example of uh, extreme value statistics because uh, this is just a minimum of a set of random variables, right? So this is just to give you an example from physics. So, so this brings us to the general setting. So, I mean, if I want to set up this problem, what is the general setting of the problem? So the general setting of the problem is the following. Imagine that you have a time series, xi versus i. It could be, the, for example, the, the price of a stock it could be the height of the river that I showed you, or temperature, or rainfall, whatever, you know. Or it could be just the the eigenvalues of your uh, of your uh, matrix, random matrix. Okay, so lambda i versus i, and uh, 
So these are your time series entries, if you like, or Hamiltonian entries. And these entries, you know, they are usually random variables, and there is an underlying joint distribution of these random variables. Now, this we don't have often knowledge about this joint distribution, and this is the modeling part. So depending on your data from from real, uh, you know, uh, data, you have to first build up a model uh, for this uh, joint distribution. Okay. So this is the called the modeling part, which the data scientists and statisticians they do this. Okay. And they could be independent, these variables, which means that the joint distribution will factorize, or they could be correlated, which means that they are not factorized. Okay. So now if you give me this joint distribution, so this is the first part of the problem, okay, to build a model for this joint distribution. And the second part is actually that given this joint distribution, you might be interested in the extreme observables. By observables, I mean, for example, that what is the maximum of this set of random variables? So I have n random variables, and I look at, for example, here, this, is, this guy is the biggest one, so this is the maximum. Or you could be interested in the minimum, like in the um, uh, in, in uh, uh, <coughs> uh, disordered system problem, ground state energy. You could be the minimum, or it could be the maximum. So you are interested in the magnitude of the maximum or the magnitude of the minimum. Okay, so this is the max or mean of this set of random variables, and there are other observables also. So the main question is that given this joint distribution, okay, which, may, which you know the experimentalists have given me, let's say, uh, we have built some idea about the joint distribution. So the next step is that using this joint distribution, what can I say about the statistics of x max, for example, its mean value, or its average value, or its distribution. So, so, so the general question is that given the joint distribution, what can we say about the statistics of x min or x max? Okay, and this is the statistical physics part, computation part, basically. Okay, so first part is the modeling part, the joint distribution itself, and second, which is also non-trivial, is that given the joint distribution, what can I say about the distribution of various observables x man, x mix, x max, x min, etc. Okay. But this is not the only one. There are other extreme observables. For example, you might be interested at what time does the maximum occur. So this is a Tmax. Tmax is also a random variable. If I, if you start another sample, Tmax will occur at some other place. And similarly, Tmin, the time at which the minimum occurs. Okay. So this is the time of the extreme, basically. So statistics of Tmax and Tmix. So these are also observables. So again, given the joint distribution, how do I compute the distribution of Tmin or Tmax, for example? Or the other problem is the order statistics. For example, in quantum mechanics, I mean, we're not only interested in the ground state, but you might be interested in the first excited states. That means ground state is the absolute minimum. And the first excited state is the next minimum. Second excited state is the second minimum, and so on. Or from the maximum side, you can ask for global maximum, second maximum, third maximum. And often in the dynamics of quantum systems, we are interested also in the gap between the first maximum and the second maximum, or you know the gap between the ground state and the first excited state, and so on. So these are called order statistics. That means order means the order of the different uh, maximum or minimum. Okay. Then there's another important observable is what is called the record statistics. So what do I mean by, by records? I mean all of us have uh, all of us have heard of records. I mean when you open a newspaper, they always talk about records in sports in cricket. We always hear that Tendulkar or Virat Kohli has made many records and so on. And uh, so record statistics means the following. So you have this, you know, again, this time series Xi versus I, uh, which are drawn from some joint distribution, okay, very generally. And then we say a record happens at step k if the value there, the entry of the time series there, xk, is bigger than all other previous values, right? That's what we mean by record. A record means that it's bigger than everything else before. Okay, so for example, in this example, these red dots are records. So this guy is a record because there is nothing before it. Number two is also a record because this value is bigger than number one. These two guys are not records. This guy is a record. These are not records. Then this, there is a record again. So the records are interspersed. You know, they don't happen next to each other. Not everything is a record. Okay, so 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 naturally, you can ask. Uh, uh, what is the num first natural question is what is the number of records if I go up, up to step n that is my time series of size n how many records occur in the time series okay so this is the typically you know, in people in global warming that's what they look for the temperature records okay 
and uh, so that's the first question how can I, what 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 can i say about the statistics of uh, the number of records up to step in okay or you can ask how long does the record survive so today you know let's say you know uh, tendulkar made uh, 50 centuries then uh, who is going to break the record how many years should we have to wait before the next record occurs so these are called ages of records how how long do the record survive okay and you know, as I said, you know, these are these are many applications in sports, in evolution models, in biology, in disorder systems, in spin glasses, avalanches, uh, earthquakes. I mean, in avalanches, first of all, earthquakes. I mean, these are you know, this is the avalanche between uh, between two events, uh, and uh, then growing networks. There is some strange sound coming. Yes, and Navin Bharti, can you mute? Yeah, thank you. Sorry. So, growing networks and global warming and many other things. So, oops. Navin Bharti. Navin Bharti. Just mute. Yeah. So, I mean, here is in one example. The you know, for example, this is a paper by Sid Redner and Mark Peterson, who actually used these uh, extreme statistics or uh, record statistics. Uh, to uh, to study the uh, role of global warming for example for instance and so on okay so so this is the general setting so essentially just to uh, recount that you have to you have to give the joint distribution somehow and uh, given the joint distribution you want to study the different uh, you know observables basically okay so that's the general problem so let me start with the simplest classical model that have been very well studied for a very long time and in the simplest classical model is this is joint distribution of the of your underlying time series entries they are completely uncorrelated okay so this is called the iid random variables independent and identically distributed so it's a product of the individual variables and all the p's are same basically so this is why it's called iid variables so the famous most famous example of iid variables actually also is in disordered systems this is for instance this so called the random energy model of derrida so derrida wanted to study a disordered system and in the disordered system, what he assumed is that you have the energy levels of your system, E1, E2, E3. And as I said, you know, these energy levels vary from one disordered sample to another disordered sample. So instead of looking at a particular Hamiltonian, what he said is that, OK, he said, let's assume that all the energy levels are just ordered and independent random variables. Okay, So it's the simplest model. And this simplest model is solvable. And it actually has shed a lot of light on uh, you know exactly solvable model which has given it shed a lot of light on these other systems which is usually a very difficult problem okay so and uh, so in this case as i said you know this problem is completely solvable i mean you can calculate the statistics of several observables for example x, x max or x min or t max or t min uh, order gap record statistics and so on i'm not going through all the details but just to show you an example how to compute the uh, distribution of the maximum if you give me the joint distribution in the factorized form like this okay just to show you an example okay so so i have this joint distribution which is factorized by so you have given me this little p of x and given the little p of x i want to know how do i calculate the distribution of the maximum of these variables right so this is what i want to calculate the distribution of the x max given the p of x okay that's my problem so <clears throat> So to do this, actually, the idea is to actually the right observable to look at is not the PDF of X max, but rather the cumulative distribution of the X max. So that means you, see, you define what is the probability that the X max is less than or equal to some W. If you know the cumulative distribution, just by taking the derivative, you can get the, you know, the distribution of X max, right? PDF of X max. So this cumulative distribution, Q and W, so this is the probability that the X max, the maximum, is less than W. Which means, since this is the maximum, if maximum is less than W, that means necessarily that each of them has to be less than W. So this is the event. What's the probability that all of each of them is less than W? And because they are completely independent, so you can factorize this, and this becomes the probability that any one of them is less than W to the power n, right? Because also all of them are IID variables. So therefore, you see that this is an exact formula, which you can write as 1 minus W to infinity as this, uh, because it's a normalized to one, okay? So it's a very simple exact formula. So if you give me P of X, uh, for example, you can give me Gaussian distribution or exponential distribution, whatever you like. I just plug it in here, 
and I get the cumulative distribution of the maximum. And then by taking the derivative, I can get the PDF of the maximum. Okay. So this is an exact formula. But then as physicists often we ask that is there uh, sort of any universality here? Of course, you see that it depends explicitly on P of X. Okay. But is there any, any feature which is independent of the details of p of x okay and typically this happens as you know in statistical physics systems usually when the system size becomes large in the thermodynamic limit so the question is here is that when n becomes very large i mean are there any universal features that come out of this formula okay and indeed it does in fact all that happens is that you know if, if you take p of x it, you see when n is large and if w is large this this object becomes very small and it depends only on the tail of p of x okay so when n is large w is large you can actually write this joint distribution in a scaling form with a appropriately centered and scaled so this a n and b n that depend on the details of the p of x of course you just have to plug in the you know the tail behavior of px in this formula so they, they depend on the tails but once you put in this centering and the width the scaling function turns out to be completely universal it depends only on uh, there are only three possible scaling functions okay so for example i mean if you you know uh, so so this is this is the this is, these are the called so like you know for example if you instead of extreme if you instead of maximum if you look at the average of x1 x2 x3 xn you know by central limit theorem that the average always flows into the uh, Gaussian distribution in the long time limit. Okay, And here you can ask, you're asking the similar question, do we flow to some universal distribution? And it turns out as opposed to average, which has a uh, Gaussian distribution, as long as the variance is finite. I mean, here it turns out there are only three different classes of universal distribution, fixed point distributions, uh, which depend on the tail of P of X. Okay, So these are called the laws of extremes as opposed to law of averages, the central limit theorem. And, uh, and this has been studied quite a lot uh, in, the, in the mathematics literature. And uh, so the, what are the three classes? So for example, if your P of X, let's say it decays very fast, like exponential or faster, Gaussian, uh, stretched exponential, with stretched exponent bigger than one, and uh, well, stretched exponent bigger than zero. I mean, all these cases, it turns out that the scaling function of the cumulative distribution, once appropriately centered and scaled, it actually has a universal functional form. This is a cumulative distribution, which is exponential of minus exponential of minus z. Okay, so this is called the Gumbel distribution. On the other hand, if p of x has a slow fat tail, as a power law tail, like x to the power minus gamma plus one for large x, then it turns out it has a slightly different form. Well, this is called the Fréchet distribution. And the third one is if p of x is bounded, uh, let's say it's bounded above um, by uh, to one and it sort of behaves like a power law near the bounds. And then it has a different distribution, so it's called Weibull distribution. So if you take the derivative of them and plot the PDF, these three universal PDFs, they look like this. So this is the Gumbel, this is the Fréchet, and this is the Weibull distribution. Okay. Now what is beautiful is that, uh, I mean, you can prove mathematically that there are no other extreme value statistics possible. I mean, as long as they're independent and identical, there are only these three fixed point distributions. No matter which P of X you start from, you will flow into one of these three fixed points in the large N limit, okay? Just, just like the central limit theorem of average. Here, there are three possibilities. And so you just have to decide what is the tail of your P of X, and then you are guaranteed that as long as they are independent, you will flow into one of the three classes, okay? So this is the classical model, and where the thing, variables are totally independent, okay? Now, our interest have been for a while on these extreme value statistics in correlated system, where unfortunately, you know, this factorization of joint distribution does not work, okay? So, so you cannot factorize the joint distribution. There are correlations between these variables. Uh, and uh, so the question is, in most of the practical situations, this is the case. I mean, for example, if you look at the, you know, Ising model or any other system, uh, disordered systems, you know, things are usually correlated. Uh, and so what can you say <clears throat> about the extreme statistics of correlated variables? And this is a non-trivial problem because of these correlations, okay? because you cannot factorize this distribution. So there is one case which is sort of, which can be dealt with relatively easy, is when these variables are weakly correlated. By weakly correlated, I mean these time series entries. If you look, if you look at the two-point connected correlation function, it typically decays, let's say, exponentially or faster 
with some characteristic correlation length psi, which means that they are essentially correlated up to a distance psi, okay? And beyond that, they get they essentially get uncorrelated. So these are called weakly correlated variables. Sir. And uh, so for such a case, you can use a very simple renormalization group uh, argument to, uh, to, to compute the distribution of extremes. So for example, if I'm interested in the distribution of the global maximum of all these time series entries, so what I'll do is I'll divide my system into blocks of correlation length psi, okay, as you see in this picture, okay. Now what I know is that global maximum, okay, so now what I do is I, from each block, I find out the, you know, global maximum of each, um, maximum of each block. So these are shown by these blue dots here, okay. So they're maximum from each block. Now, of course, so this, I call them ZI here. ZI is the maximum of the ith block. And the point is that these ZI variables, they are essentially uncorrelated, right? Because they belong to different correlation blocks, roughly speaking, okay. So, now the global maximum, which is my x max, this is also the maximum of all these blue guys, right? So max of z1, z2, z3, zn. But you see that these z1, z2, z3 variables, they are essentially uncorrelated because their distance is bigger than the correlation length. And therefore, I mean, what you would expect from the general theory of uncorrelated variables, because these are uncorrelated, so we'll again the, go back to the um, uncorrelated fixed point, that means your um, distribution of the weakly correlated variables, maximum distribution, will be again one of the three classes, uh, Gumbel, Fresh, or Eibold, depending on the distribution of ZI. And ZI distribution, you can, I mean, inside the block, of course, is strongly correlated. So you don't know what is the ZI of distribution, but what you know is from your numerics or whatever, you can easily com compute it still. And once you know the tail, you know that you will flow into one of the, you know, three fixed points, Fresh, Gumbel, or Eibold. So you don't get any new universality classes here uh, for the uh, for the uh, distribution of the maximum. So therefore, weakly correlated variables is relatively easy. I mean, you have only a few to determine the case. Can you, can you please mute? There's a sound coming. Yeah. Sasi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Professor Majumdar, actually, I wanted to ask a question. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, so like the partition boundary across the partition boundary, there will yeah. be uh, correlation. Yeah, of course, right? no, no, of course, there will be. That's why I said roughly. I mean, I, this is a heuristic argument. Uh, of course, there are correlations across the boundaries. Okay, but as long as your size is much bigger than this width of this, but much less than n, you will still flow into one of these fixed points. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, Thanks. So, so the, the point is that, you know, in many systems, what happens is that the, the random variables are not weakly correlated, but they're strongly correlated. By strongly correlated, I mean the correlation length is of order n or bigger, okay? Which means that all the variables are very strongly correlated. So you cannot use these block arguments anymore, okay? So in this case, extreme value statistics is very hard, strongly correlated for any, like any strongly correlated systems. And there are very few exact results here. And so, I mean, our interest Main interest have been for the last few years is to study the extreme value statistics in such strongly correlated systems. Okay, so that's the sort of main topic of my uh, for the rest of half an hour of my talk. Okay, so extreme value statistics in strongly correlated systems. What can we say about them? How do we go about it? Okay, I mean, what? How do we even start this problem? Okay, to 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 address. So and here, what I want to show you is that the statistical physics tools can be very useful. In what way? Okay. So, what is the key idea? How do we use statistical physics tools here? Okay. So, the idea is the following. So, again, I'm interested in the distribution, let's say, of the maximum of this set of random variables. And as before, the key object is to look at the cumulative distribution of the maximum. So, cumulative distribution, that means maximum, what's the probability the maximum is less than or equal to some number w? Okay. So, as I said, this is the same event as the probability that each of these guys are less than w. This is true, this is very general. Only problem is uh, earlier I could factorize it, now I cannot factorize anymore, okay? So now what is it if I cannot factorize? So I know the joint distribution. You have given me the joint distribution. So this object here is just a multiple integral, right? I have to take this joint in distribution and I have to integrate each of the xi variables up to w from minus infinity to w, okay? 
So that's the problem. I mean, I have to just main technical challenge is to evaluate these multiple integrals and find out what is how what can I say about this distribution. Okay. The main trouble is that we cannot do this multiple integral exactly because I don't know this it doesn't factorize. And in general, multiple integrals are very hard to do. I mean, anyway, okay, when there are correlations between them. So the point is that, and here this is a very nice interpretation. So you see this P of x1, x2, x3, xn, I can always write it as exponential minus E x1, x2, xn. E is just a log of minus P, uh, sorry, minus of log P, okay? So once I write this, then I can interpret this P as e to the, as a like Boltzmann factor, e to the power minus E, right? Well, beta is one, let's say, you know, inverse temperature is one. So then, so what you have is, so this, you can interpret this as a, the energy of a strongly interacting gas of n particles with positions x size that are confined from minus infinity to w, okay? So therefore, what you have is really a statistical physics system. This q and w is just a partition function because if you write this as e to the power minus e, then this is just a, you know, just a partition function of your gas, except that there's a hard wall at w. You cannot, because the integrals are from minus infinity to w. So it's like all your particle. You have these particles with, which has strong correlations between them, and they are in a semi-infinite system from minus infinity to w. Okay, so they cannot go on this side because the integral is limited. Upper limit is w. And uh, what you want to um, this q and w is exactly the partition function of this gas of particles in the presence of a hard wall. Okay, but you know partition function for uh, interacting or strongly interacting system. I mean, we are very familiar with in statistical physics. That's that's our bread and butter. We always do that, basically. Okay. So, so let's see first what what simplification happens. I mean, in this language, what happens to the case of IID random variables? So you see the IID case when this joint distribution factorizes into individual distributions. So the energy, which is minus of log p, it just becomes minus of log of p x i. So the energy is just the sum of individual energies, if you like. So what you see is that there is no correlation between the xi variables. So this is just an ideal gas, basically, okay? ideal non-interacting gas. And now we know how to, how to compute the partition function of an ideal gas very easily. And that's why the IID case, the classical case is very simple. Okay? And, and in fact, so I mean, as you know, partition function of n particles for non-interacting ideal gas, it just factorizes and it just becomes the partition function of a single particle to the power n okay so this is this is the reason why this is easier to handle basically iid case okay but whenever you have interaction you can no longer you know your uh, write your energy as a sum of individual energies because there are correlation there is a you know quadratic you know bicoupling term triple coupling term all this correlation function in energy and so it's no longer uh, non-interacting case, okay? And that's why the extreme value statistics is the partition function of an interacting statistical mechanics systems, mechanical system, okay? So no factorization. But I mean, in statistical physics, you are familiar with many tools. I mean, for example, there are, you know, exactly solvable interacting models. Uh, I mean, sometimes, you know, you can solve it in the large end limit using saddle point method uh, or path integrals method, mean field theory, renormalization group method, large deviation theory. There are many, many different tools which are available to deal with strongly correlated system in statistical physics. And once you have cast this uh, extreme value statistics into this language, we can use these tools to, to, to solve many cases of strongly interacting system. Okay? So in a nutshell, you know, this is, this is the thing that we have been doing for the last few years. And I just give you, you know, just to end my talk with some few examples of this uh, without giving you, you know, details. I mean, just, just to show you. But this is the, basically the methodology. This is the idea, essentially. Okay. So I'll talk about four examples. Uh, so the first one I'll talk about, and, and here the physics will come, the real space condensation in mass transport models. And then I'll just talk about Brownian motion or random walks. Uh, and then finally, briefly on random matrices. And the last one is about stochastic search processes, which are related to computer science problems. So let me start with the first one, real space condensation. What do I mean by real space condensation? 
So, I mean, many of you are familiar with Bose-Einstein condensation, which happens in ideal Bose gases, for example, dilute Bose gases in dimensions two or bigger, where essentially, uh, you know, at low temperature, let's say in ground state, a macroscopically large number of bosons, they condense onto the ground state. Okay, so that means there's a large number of bosons is in one of the energy eigenvalues, which is the ground state, lowest energy eigenvalue. And so here the condensation happens in momentum space or energy space, if you like, okay. Now, there are examples in uh, physics, I mean, where actually condensation can happen in real space, okay? So let me just give you uh, one example. And this is an experiment in granular system. So it's a shaken granular gas. So these people actually did this experiment in 2007. So what you have here is, you know, boxes like this. These boxes are interconnected. There are holes between these boxes. And... Um, and, and it's a periodic boundary condition in this direction. So this, this guy here, you, when a particle leaves this box here, it enters through this, this box on the left-hand side. Okay. And you fill up with some you know, pith balls, which are this granular gas, basically, if you like. Yeah. And, uh, and then you just shake this whole uh, you know, things vertically with some frequency and amplitude. And you see, you know, and because of this, the particles, because of shaking, these particles uh, can go from one box to another box. There's a mass transport. And you ask uh, what happens in the long time limit. Okay, so of course there are many parameters in this model. So, for example, you know the vibration frequency or amplitude, or you can ask, you know, I, I mean, these are these holes are made at the same height. The height is a parameter. The width of the hole is also a parameter. The size of the balls. So there are many many parameters. Then there is you know uh, temperature and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to the details. But what this experiment has found is that you know in some parameter space, you know some parameter regime. Uh, if you wait for long enough time, the system goes into a steady state. And in the steady state, what you see is that a macroscopically large number of balls, I mean, these little balls, they condense into one of the boxes, okay, which is spontaneously chosen, meaning that, you know, there's, there's a symmetry here. They translate, you know, all the boxes are identical, okay. So the spontaneous uh, translational symmetry is spontaneously broken. The system in the long time limit basically selects one of the sites it could have could have been any sites uh, where there's a large number of particles shown by red here okay so this is the analog of the condensate if you like so it's exactly like the bose einstein condensation but here it happens in real space as opposed to momentum space okay so so then you know so you want to know you know this you want to characterize this steady state and uh, how do we characterize and in particular you want to know how what is the, exactly the number of con particles in the condensate how many particles out of the total number of n particles how many of them are in the condensate okay so to set up this problem you see what is the connection to extreme value statistics because you have to realize you know what are the relevant variables so here the relevant variables is this ni variables which is the occupation of the ith box how many particles are there in the ith box that's the ni okay so if you give me n1 n2 n3 this series so this is exactly like or general setting the time series x1, x2, x3, x, 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 xn, if you like. So if I take the, if you, if you give me this n1, n2, n3, etc., then you see that the condensate mass, number of particles in the condensate, is just a maximum of all these variables, right? So if I know the, you know, the joint distribution of the NIs, I mean, then, you know, I mean, I can try to compute the distribution of the number of particles in the condensate, okay? So all I need is the joint distribution, and and this is an example of a strongly correlated system, because you know the you know you have conservation laws in the system. In total number of particles is conserved, and as a result, these NIs get very strongly correlated. There's no you know correlation length of order one or finite. These things is actually you know infinite. I mean infinite means of the order of n, and so this is a pro example of strongly correlated system. I mean again, I'm not going into the details. I mean you have been working for a long time. And so the theory that we constructed is basically we first computed the joint distribution of the NI variables. I mean, that's where, you know, the physics will come in. And once we know this in this particular case, because there's a global mass cons conservation constraint, the, uh, and that's how the strong correlation comes in, we could actually, you know, solve the distribution of the condenser exactly. Again, I will not give you the details, uh, but this is the main idea essentially. I mean, you can find out the details in these papers. I mean, uh, and there are many, you know, collaborators with whom I have worked on this problem. And uh, and this real space condensation turned out to be, you know, quite generally, it happens in many other problems. For example, in the uh, diffusion aggregation fragmentation models, when you have a big atomic cluster deposition on a substrate or polymer gel. So when a polymer gel means a big gel forms, 
or the formation of clouds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you can have traffic models. You know, you know again, in a, you know, on a highway when you have traffic jams. So the jam is an example of a condensate. Uh, Okay. And uh, then you have growing networks, for example, and if you have growing, you know, any uh, scientific, I mean, any, any network, if you uh, internet network, you see there are sometimes there are big hubs, which is like, for example, the Google, which is a big hub, everybody goes to Google. Uh, and uh, so this is like a giant component, if you like. So this is an example of a condensate in real space. Then in active particles, in run and tumble active particles, you can have a giant run. So this is some recent work that we we did with uh, many other uh, collaborators. Uh, and then also you can have discrete nonlinear Schrodinger equation where you have a formation of localized wave function. And again, you can have uh, real space condensation there. Okay. So I'll not go into the details, but just to give you an idea. So then my next example is random walks and levy flight. So most of you are familiar with random walks. Uh, so I'm considering a random walk, let's say very simple, one dimensional random walk. Uh, uh, so xi is the location of the particle of a single random walker at so time is discrete and space is continuous uh, so xi is the position of the walker at the ith step so it's a markov jump process so xi at time step i is the previous position at a, at time in i minus one plus a jump okay and this is a continuous space it's not a lattice random walk so jump uh, it i and uh, and these jump variables are drawn independently independently from some symmetric distribution p of eta. So, for example, it could be, uh, you know, it could be Gaussian distribution. It could be uniform distribution. It could have even a fat tail like Levy flights. Uh, if the, if, you know, fine. If the variance of this jump distribution is finite, then it, we call it a normal walk, like normal random walk. If it has a fat tail such that the variance is infinite, then this is called the Levy flight. Okay. So okay, you can you know you can uh, so this this random walk models have been very well studied, and this is another example of a strongly correlated system because even though the in the increments jump increments are themselves uncorrelated, okay, they're independent from side to side, uh, but you know the xi which is sum of the jumps uh, jump increments, uh, so xi themselves get correlated. In fact, you can write down explicitly joint distribution of the uh, the positions of the walkers at different times. This is actually a product of p of xi plus one minus xi. So you see the xi variables themselves are correlated. They don't factorize. They factorize into the joint distribution of this thing of uh, increments. But the point is that the xi themselves are actually correlated. Okay. However, in this problem again, because of this simplification that the increments are uncorrelated, you can still make uh, progress. You can ask what's the distribution of the maximum. Okay of uh, this random walker you know what's the maximum displacement up to step in and you know it's, it's easier for brownian motion to compute this uh, but uh, you know when you go to levy flights and other problems it's much more harder and again what we want to calculate is the probability that the cumulative distribution of uh, w x max that means what's the probability that the maximum is less than w and then it's a you know problem of persistence or survival probability you're asking what's the probability that your your stochastic process stays below a level w up to step in okay so this is this uh, famous you know uh, persistence or survival probability or first passage problem if you like okay and this has been you know again for as i said you know it's solvable for brownian motion using path integral of hocker planck method but for uh, levy flights it's much harder and again you know we, we have worked quite a lot on this uh, and with various collaborators uh, and it has many many applications from uh, finance to ecology and so on but i'll not uh, have time to go into the details just to give you one example of the active particles i mean so these days there's a lot of activity in the active particle system so what is active particle i mean passive brownian motion everybody knows from my instance work uh, which means uh, that basically that uh, you know this yellow particle is a, is a you know is a particle immersed in a fluid and this particle does not have any autonomous motion it just stays there but it moves because the other gas or fluid particles around it they move randomly and they hit this yellow particle from time to time and because of this random hitting this guy moves around very slowly typically and this is the usual diffusion that's the usual brownian motion okay this is called passive because passive because it doesn't have any inherent motion on its own in contrast, active particles, for example, E. coli bacteria, what happens there is this uh, E. coli bacteria, you know, typically it starts from one point in space uh, 
and it runs in one direction. So it absorbs energy directly from the envir environment, and then it sort of has a self-propelled motion in a particular direction. And this direction is decided by its tail. So, I mean, it has a flagellar tail, and it sort of, you know, it, it, the tail, if the tail is like this, the particle moves in the opposite direction. And it typically moves, runs uh, for a certain exponentially distributed time. And then it dis, you know, it orients its flagellar tails like this and changes its direction. And then again, it moves for an exponential distribution distributed time uh, randomly uh, in a random direction. And then again, it changes. So these are called run and tumble. Tumble means change of orientation, essentially. Okay. So, so here, you know, you, you, this guy here is called active because it does not need other particles to move it. It's a self-propelled motion. It can move on its own, autonomous motion. And, uh, and these are called active uh, run and tumble particles, for instance. Uh, and uh, you have these two parameters, which is this gamma, which is tumbling rate, uh, and the WV, which is the distribution of the speed and uh, that it chooses after every tumbling. Okay. And, uh, and there's a lot of studies here. And again, you can ask this question of extreme statistics. That means you can ask, what's the maximum displacement of such a bacterial particle in a certain direction? And again, this is a much harder problem, a strongly correlated example. And OK, I will not go into the details, but you know, it turns out that this model can be solved exactly. And it has a many beautiful um, you know, universal features. Uh, so this is a recent work that was done by my student, uh, Francisco Mori in collaboration with Pele Dushal and Gregory Shared that you can find in this paper. But I don't have time to go into the details. Uh, OK, so very quickly, uh, just um, random matrix theory. So as I said before, that uh, random matrix theory means that you are interested in this uh, spectrum of these eigenvalues, uh, of, a, of the eigenvalues of a random matrix, uh, Gaussian random Hermitian matrix. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, it turns out that the joint distribution of the eigenvalues, I said eigenvalues get correlated even though the entries aren't correlated. And the joint distribution of the eigenvalues for the Gaussian matrix, you can write it explicitly. It turns out that this is just exponential minus lambda is square. And then there's a van der Mond term, which is product of lambda j minus lambda k square. Okay. So this is derived by Wigner a long time back. So, so you see that you know, if you did not have this van der Mond term, okay, if you did not have this van der Mond term, then of course uh, you know, the thing will be totally uncorrelated because the joint distribution will factorize. It's just Gaussian distributions, independent Gaussian distributions. It's because of this term here which makes it correlated and it becomes strongly correlated. And uh, in fact, uh, to see this, uh, you, you can write down, you know, you know, this this factor, you know, x. You can always write down x equal to e to the power log x. So therefore, you can write this van der Mond term and raise it inside the exponential. And as I said before, you can write it explicitly in a Boltzmann form. This joint distribution, you can write exponential of minus of some energy of these lambda I variables, and the energy has two terms here. So. So the first term, so you can interpret the energy as the positions of a particles on a line, uh, the eigenvalues. Uh, and then it has two terms in it. Uh, so the first term is a, just a quadratic term individually. So that means all of them are subjected to a parabolic potential, confining potential. And then there's an interaction term, which comes from the van der Mond, which says that two particles, any two pair of particles, they repel each other by a logarithmic interaction. Okay, so. Um, so there's a log. This is why it's called the log log gas, basically. It's a logarithmic repulsion. So it's like 2D Coulomb, but this is not 2D. This is a 1D line because eigenvalues are real numbers. They're on a 1D line, but they are repelling each other by the log interaction. Okay, and um, and this is what makes this interaction, which makes this problem much more difficult to solve. And this was, you know, so essentially, then if you are interested in the lambda max or lambda mean equivalently. So this means, again, the cumulative distribution. That means you want to calculate this partition function of this gas in the eigenvalues, which are confined between minus infinity to W. That's the cumulative distribution. And again, by taking derivative, you can get the PDF of lambda max. Okay. And, uh, and you know, this is, a, this is one of the rare examples of an exactly solvable, strongly correlated system. And this has been done in the mathematics literature by two mathematicians called Tracy and Widom. And what they showed, I mean, is, is still you know, non-trivial because of this uh, log interaction term to do this multiple integral, but they did it uh, in the large and limit. Uh, and what they showed, these are Tracy and Widom, and Tracy and Widom, and what, you, what they showed is that this is a scaling form. So this cumulative distribution is a function of W minus root two, 
uh, times n to the power two thirds. So this is width, which is about n to the power minus two thirds, and it fluctuates around its mean value, the largest eigenvalue around this root two. And uh, and then it has a non-trivial non-Gaussian tails on both sides. It's asymmetric distribution. And uh, you know this Tracy-Williams distribution appeared in 1994, but since then it has appeared in many many different problems. Uh, I don't have time to go through all this. You know, from directed polymer to large and gauge theory to liquid crystals, spin glasses, and many other problems. Uh, and uh, in fact, it has been ex you know realized in experiments uh, on liquid crystals uh, as well as coupled lasers and uh, disordered superconductors. This is from from India actually. And. Uh, and you know many other things, and you know Tracy Williams distribution is everywhere. And if you are interested, there's a very nice, there are a couple of nice uh, articles, uh, popular science articles. Uh, it's one by Mark Buchanan in Nature Physics in 2014 on equivalence principle, and the other one is by Natalie Olchover in Quanta magazine at the far ends of a new universal law. So you see this Tracy Williams distribution, <clears throat> and it's related to many many different uh, areas and uh, disciplines and so on. And uh, we have been working quite a lot on this problem. And uh, just to uh, again give you a flavor, so Tracy Widom distribution describes the distribution of the um, largest eigenvalue on a scale of order n to the power minus two third typical fluctuations. But in many applications, you are interested in atypically large fluctuations. You know what the tail of this distribution. Okay, and uh, and what happens is that the, the so this is the schematic plot the PDF of lambda max. So this is the Tracy Williams distribution, which describes the typical fluctuations on a scale of n to the power minus two third. But you can ask, you know, what about the you know, two extreme tails? And it appears it has many applications. Uh, and they are not described by the Tracy Williams distribution. So what we showed is that the, you know, the tail of the distributions on the left and right have very different behavior. So on the left, it goes like n to the power minus n square into some function. And on the right, it's e to the power minus n. Okay. And uh, in fact, so what happens as n goes to infinity and becomes very large, you see the width here, you know, decreases as n to the power minus two third. So, so what happens is the large n limit, this essentially the Tracy Widom region almost reduces to a point. And all you see is really the two tails. Okay? And then it's like a, there's a, exactly like a phase transition at root two. So you go from this left phase, red phase, to the, to the green phase, which is on the right, through the critical point. So Tracy Widom is like a finite size critical behavior, you know, for scaling function at the critical point. Whereas these are the analog of the free energy of the left phase and the free energy of the right phase. And, and there's a third order phase transition, uh, which happens at this critical point root two. Okay. Again, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm not being able to explain in detail all this, but roughly speaking, you can ask, you know, what are the two phases? So it turns out, the left phase, which we call the strong coupling phase, and here, you know, the, the gas of particles or eigenvalues, if you like, they are pushed together. So they, they are very strongly interacting regime. Whereas in the weak coupling phase, what happens is that uh, they more or less are distributed uniformly, in the, I'm not uniformly, but you know, in a semicircle law in the bulk. But then one guy, because you are looking for uh, what's the probability that the largest eigenvalue is much bigger than its typical value root two. So the configuration that com, you know the dom dominates this uh, event is the one where n minus one charges stay inside this uh, bulk, and then one guy, you know, you just have to pull out one charge. So this is like a pulled phase, uh, the green one, and this is like a pushed phase because here you are deviating to the left. That means you are pushing all your charges to the left, and uh, and this is these you know the same phases that appear in gauge theory. Here it's called the there is called the strong coupling and weak coupling phase. And in analogy, we call it also strong coupling and weak coupling phases. And in fact, the, in the gauge theory language, this third order phase transition was first discovered by Witten, Wadia, and uh, David Gross long to back in the 80s. And the phenomenology is very similar to as here. OK, so there are several other interesting problems in dynamic theory. And there's an enormous amount of recent results, both in the physics and mathematics literature. So if you are interested in this topic, I mean, I can just, you know, refer to some recent review of recent means about 10, so eight years back, a review article that I wrote with uh, my colleague Gregory Scher uh, on this uh, third order phase transition and large deviations. And I'll finish my talk just uh, last one uh, slide. So I men mentioned about the stochastic search process, which is another example of uh, uh, strongly correlated extreme value applications. And as you know, search process is ubiquitous in nature. You know, you do Google search all the time. Then the protein searching for a binding site on a DNA. 
animals searching for food. It's called foraging. And uh, so there are different search strategies uh, that are involved depending on the process. And uh, but typically, uh, I mean, you have to op always optimize your search strategy. That means usually what you know, basically what people do is that you have to associate some kind of cost function. So you, you employ a search algorithm and you ask, you know, how much, what is the cost of this algorithm? Okay. And then you want to find out the search process, which has the lowest cost. So this is the optimal uh, search strategy. And uh, so depending on the problem, you know, basically what you have to do is to minimize an appropriate cost function subject to certain constraints. Okay. So again, you are looking for the minimum of a function or a set of random functions and in some presence of some constraint so you can cast this problem as a problem of extreme value statistics of strongly correlated variables i mean an example uh, recently we looked at with my colleague martin evans so this is on stochastic resetting which is an efficient uh, target search strategy and uh, unfortunately i don't have time to tell you about this but here uh, the cost function is just a mean first passage time to reach a target and once again, the extreme value statistics, you know, play a very crucial role in this optimal to decide the optimal search parameters in this in these problems. Uh, and uh, so there was again a review, recent review that we wrote on this subject. If you are interested, so let me wrap it up my talk now. So to summarize, extreme value statistics, there are basically two uh, fundamental steps involved. So the step one is the modeling. That means given the data uh, or experiments. I mean or time, you know, any time series, you have to first estimate, uh, you know, what are the joint series distribution? For example, you can, this you can do even numerically. I mean, if you have many samples, I mean, then you just, you know, find out what is the joint distribution of these guys. So this is the first part, uh, which is also already a difficult part to model building part, basically. And the second part is the computation part. So this is that given the joint distribution, you want to calculate the distribution of you know, several extreme observables like the distribution of the maximum. And this is where the, you know, the computational part where the statistical physics is very useful. Because I mean, I mean, as we know, statistical physics, I mean, it gives Boltzmann tells you the distribution of a configuration. But from that, to compute the any observable is a, is a hard problem. And that is the statistical physics. And here it's exactly similar similar uh, idea essentially so the, here then statistical physics is very tools are very useful to compute the distribution of the maximum especially for strongly correlated variables and uh, so you know it's a, it's a very sort of um, exciting and rapidly evolving field of research with many applications on one side you know you have the statistics geology finance epidemiology engineering and so on and on the application side on and on the fundamental side on the other side you have statistical physics and as i said you know disordered systems random matrix theory coulomb gas gauge theory cold atoms and all the way to number theory and mathematics uh, and um, so we wrote a, again a sort of uh, pedagogical review on this subject in which appeared in physics reports in two years back i mean if, if you're interested it's, it's not a too long article i mean you, you can you know you can find out many other open problems, uh, interesting open problems on this subject. Uh, let me acknowledge my uh, collaborators. So there have been many graduate students uh, involved in this, uh, Francisco Mori, Anna Flack, uh, Benjamin Deep Duin, and Pierre Marni. And previously, uh, these are current PhD students, uh, and the postdocs, and many collaborators here at Orsay. And also, I had the fortune of collaborating with many other people outside uh, or say and uh, and of course you know, all of them made very important contributions uh, and uh, so i thank all of them and i thank you for your attention thank you thank you professor it, it is time for questions yeah can i ask one question yes please yes, yes. for a weekly correlated systems uh, you are considering mm -hmm. global maximum yes yeah for uh, i am considering that i am thinking this way that i have a data mm -hmm. uh, 30 years or 50 years data so i will get i will get only one maximum points uh, no, so, so, uh, no 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 so so what you what you do when you have one very very long time series what you can do is you can cut your time series into several blocks first. Okay? 
Yes. And uh, and so let's say you have you know ten thousand sequence, uh, then you break it into uh, you know many samples. So you break it into thousand um, you know uh, you know thousand samples each basically, and then you can think of the each each uh, you know each strand each um, little, this block as a separate samples and things like that. And from there you can actually build up these uh, histograms of joint distributions. Yes, yes, understood. And another problem is just uh, for searching problem, can we apply the same uh, concept for the uh, two particle, two interacting particle or in interacting particle? No, I mean, you know, I mean, two interacting particles is the simplest case, but in some cases you can have more than two body interactions. Like we know, I mean, you know, any, any statistical physics system, you know, Hamiltonian or energy, you can have a two body interaction, you can have a three body interaction, four body interaction. Of course, you know, the more interaction you put, the more harder it gets. Basically. Yes, so, yes. Yeah. yeah, it's okay. Fine, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Majumda, for a very beautiful uh, seminar. Uh, I have, I have some uh, basic question. I mean, uh, of a non-expert. So, can you comment on okay. the role of nonlinearity in extreme event statistics? Yeah, this is a this is a very good question. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, well, non it depends. I mean, again, you know, you can have nonlinearity, but uh, the nonlinearity question is how does the nonlinearity affect the? I mean, for me, I mean, it's always this, you know, the joint distribution of the of the uh, of the underlying random variables. So nonlinearity will affect the joint distribution. It will probably affect, you know, uh, you know, what is the effective interaction that comes in. And naturally, it will affect the extreme value statistics also. So, for instance, I mean, if you look at the, I mean, one problem we looked at is this uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and uh, where you know you have the um, uh, the, the gross pitaevsky term basically, which is the psi psi mod uh, square terms, which comes in, and uh, and there uh, again you can actually explicitly um, calculate the joint distribution. So, what you are interested in there that you have a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. I mean, you can think of a lattice model, and at each side you have this psi mod square i, okay, which is the you know the local density if you like, and then you are interested in the maximum of these variables, okay. So obviously, you know, psi mod square, you know, it's uh, in if you look at the joint distribution, they are correlated. You look at joint distribution, it's very you know important that the nonlinear term is there, which actually gives you a very different structure. If, if there is no nonlinearity. I mean, uh, then it will be completely different behavior, basically. Okay. So, so my answer is that the nonlinearity affects the joint distribution of the underlying variables, and consequently uh, the distribution of the extremes. Now, I mean, what kind of nonlinearity? Whether there are some university classes or things like that. So, this has not been very well studied yet. Yeah. Systematically. Simple uh, dynamical systems. Simple oscillator. For example, yeah, the, the right. No, I mean, actually, no, because you know, precisely, no, we can ask, yeah, yeah, even you can, you know, just take a simple nonlinear oscillator and add some noise, and you can ask this question that, you know, what is the pro distribution of the maximum displacement in one direction? Okay, and it's, this is also not so easy problem. I mean, you know, this is this persistence problems. People have looked at some of the Nonlinear dynamics, noisy nonlinear dynamics problem in in the context of persistence, and it's a, it's a similar thing. I mean, you know, uh, but there's I mean, we I mean, there's no one you know you have to study different nonlinear models. I mean, I don't think there's any general theory that uh, how nonlinearity will affect the uh, the persistence or extreme statistics essentially. Okay. Yeah, okay. thank you. You have to go by example by example. Yeah. Uh, hi. I, I am Shamal Dana. Uh, I have a very simple question, sir. Uh -huh. uh, given a joint distribution of extremes. Yes. yes. Uh, Good how it can joint, joint distribution of the entries, you mean? In, yeah, yeah. Entries. So how it can help the prediction of future events? Yeah, no, prediction of future events in the sense that, I mean, if you think, 
if you are, you know you have to make some assumption you cannot predict future of course i mean uh, what you can <laughs> say is that uh, you know what you can say is that uh, you know if you in a, in a stationary environment i mean if you think that you know the, the the on the time scale on which you are looking at things are more or less stationary so then you know if you um, if you can infer from your current data that uh, what is the distribution of the for example the uh, the maximum value of uh, some event okay yeah. so so then you know that if there is an earthquake which might happen what would be the magnitude of the earthquake roughly mm -hmm. speaking okay yeah so, and the time and the time yeah, and the time also, also and the time also <coughs> Yeah. But of course, but I mean, you don't know if the you know the thing is stationary. You know, things might like in global warming. We know that it's not stationary. I mean, there's yeah, the yeah. you know the things are changing. So, so there it's very hard to predict. So you have to make some assumptions, basically like that. Yeah, but natural systems are not stationary. Yeah, not not always. I mean, you just assume that your time scale on which you are looking at is much less than the natural time scales uh, in which it changes, basically things. So it remains a very difficult problem from giving. Yeah, a, it's a difficult problem. Certainly, problem. It's, it's a very difficult. From the, I mean, from the yeah, for the, for the prediction, I mean, you know, these joint distributions should also have a variable t, time dependent, basically. So, yes, and then it becomes, of course, much more harder. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, hello, Professor Majumdar uh, Shashi again. Uh, yes. Uh, actually, uh, so uh, about your work where you have talked about this third third order phase transition. Yes. Uh, so, so how how should I visualize the density? So, in general, the bulk has the semicircle in case of uh, the random mm -hmm. matrices. Yeah. And then towards sure. end, with certain scaling, I have the residue dome. And in that receiver yes. dome, I have to zoom further to see this uh, this two phases that you talked about, or or how should I yeah, think yeah. about? Yeah, you know, exactly. So no, it's okay. No, absolutely. So I mean, so so the point is that okay. I mean, here's a practical algorithm, right? So if you if yeah. you you know if you sample your uh, eigenvalues, okay. I mean, yeah. as you said, you know, if you look at the average density of states, that will be the witness semicircular law, okay. Right. So which means. That the the rightmost eigenvalue, the largest eigenvalue, on an average, its value will fluctuate around the right edge of the Wigner semicircle, right? Which is yeah. the square root of two in this case. Now, if you plot, if you take some from each sample, you look at the lambda max and you plot a histogram of this. So what we'll see in the histogram is uh, that uh, the the central part of the histogram is described by the Tracy Widom distribution. Okay, but if you are interested. That what is the probability the lambda? Let's say you ask this question: What's the probability that the lambda max is much less than root two? Okay. Uh -huh. So I mean, uh, let me ask even a simpler question: What is the probability that all the eigenvalues are negative? Okay. So what is the probability that the, all the eigenvalues of your random matrix are negative? Okay. Now this means that the lambda max is less than zero, right? Right. Right. Yeah. But you see that the lambda max, its, it's, it's natural value is root two, which is the right edge of semicircle, right? Yes. So you are asking for a deviation, which is of order root two, okay? Yes. A very large deviation from root two. So that means you are you are asking for the event where your lambda max is at zero. That means you are pushing all the eigenvalues to the left. Mm -hmm. So so to get this event. You know, basically, you have to uh, find out the configurations that contribute to this event, and in that configuration, the charges are all pushed to the left, and that's the that's the pushed phase. Okay. 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 Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I have one question, Professor Madhumdar. It was a yes. nice talk. Thank you. Um, so, um, uh, so any of this theory which uh, has been developed for uh, uh, largest uh, eigenvalues. Uh, mm -hmm. Can one apply any of these for the second largest eigenvalue? Or, yes. or for example, uh, does it follow any university classes are being followed by the second uh, largest? Yes, no, indeed, indeed. In, in, in fact, I mean, it is known that the second largest eigenvalue also has Tracy Widom distribution, but you know, the, the, the parameters of the scaling parameters of this distribution are slightly different from the largest one. Okay. And people have also studied the gap between the uh, first and the second eigenvalue and so on. So these things have been studied. I mean, so as long as the order, so this is the order statistics that I was referring to first eigenvalue, second eigenvalue, third eigenvalue. So it turns out that 
you know, if you look at the mth eigenvalue, and if mm -hmm. m is of order one, meaning m is not of order mm -hmm. n, okay, m doesn't scale mm -hmm. with n, uh, then uh, you know these are all basically Dresiewian distribution, but with parameters shifted. Okay, but mm -hmm. when m is of order n, then of course things change because then you are approaching the bulk; you are no longer at the edge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So it should be separated from the bulk. Yeah, it should be separated from the bulk. In order to. Yeah. yeah. I see. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, and in and the most of the cases, like if you have uh, some uh, like matrices uh, made of random numbers, only one yeah. eigenvalue would be separated from the bulk. All other would lie inside no, the no, bulk. No, no, no. I mean, in fact, I mean, if you look at the weakness semicircular law, so you see that the weakness semicircular law tells you that eigenvalues are very, you know, they are very close to each other in the bulk. There, the density uh -huh. is the highest. But as you go towards the edge. You know the the, the inter-distance between the eigenvalues becomes larger and larger. In fact, if you look at the typical separation between eigenvalues inside uh -huh. the bulk of order one over square root of n, whereas uh -huh. near the bulk, it's actually or I mean, this n to the power minus two thirds. Sorry, I mean it's one over n in the bulk and n to the power minus two third near the edges. Okay, uh -huh. so that means the, the the separation is much larger near the uh -huh. edge because the, simply because the you know number of eigenvalues there are much smaller, so they are very far from each other. In some uh -huh. sense. Uh -huh. So as, as long as soon as uh, they follow this spacing uh, uh, distance, yeah. one can apply yes. exactly. Uh, the then distance. yeah, then you can have, yeah you can apply uh -huh. the medium distribution. Uh -huh. But they are still correlated. I mean, they are not you know it's uh -huh. not uh, these things. They are correlated. Uh -huh. but, um, I mean, but still uh -huh. you know the, the at the edge they are sparse. So uh, uh -huh. you can you can you know you can. Uh, so the, all I'm saying is that the edge uh -huh. physics is very different from the bulk physics. Uh -huh. I mean. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Uh, any other question? Okay. If not, uh, let us conclude the session by thanking Professor Majumdar for uh, introducing us extreme value statistics and there are how they are helpful in solving various physics problems. Once again, I thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation and delivering a talk in this forum please let me know when you will be there when you are when will you, you will be in india so that we can meet in person or even sure. with us. Thank, thank you very much thank you very much for the invitation i mean i would definitely like to visit uh video <laughs> yes okay thank you sir okay thank you bye bye yeah